Hello everyone, welcome to this video where we will be discussing the dermatology recall questions asked in the NEET PG 2023 exam conducted just in this month of March. Like I say in every recall session, I'll very happily say in this one also that all the questions that were there in the exam, we had discussed them through our various interactions, whether it be the regular classes, the quick revision program, or even the questions that were there in the various tests before the exam, like the grand test, the mock test, the elite test series, the previous year question discussions. So I hope for all of you gave the exam you got all these derma questions correct. And for the ones who are yet to give the exam, be very thorough with all of these resources that you have because they form a very important part of your preparation, especially the test series that are before the exam and the previous year question discussion. Because like every exam in dermatology, in this exam also, almost all the questions were either repeat or it was the repeat topic. There is, you know, a very high chance of you getting all questions correct if you know the previous year's questions nicely, you know, and not just the questions, that topic as well. So, starting with the discussion, coming to a topic which I say to my students every time is the most important topic in dermatology these days because out of the eight, nine questions that are asked in the exam, at least two to three are from sexually transmitted diseases. Yes, STDs have now become the most important topic in any and every exam that you get. So, a very important part of that here is this question, a very relevant question. A patient presented with painless irregular ulcers and inguinal swelling, what is the diagnosis? So, the patient here has a painless ulcer with a painless inguinal swelling which is a lymphadenopathy. So, a painless ulcer with painless lymphadenopathy, what is the diagnosis? We have syphilis, chancroid, LGV and granuloma inguinal in the options. I know that most of you know the correct answer. The correct answer here is option A that is syphilis because that is the only one which is a painless ulcer with a painless inguinal lymphadenopathy. Chancroid is painful, LGV comes with a painful bubo and not an ulcer and granuloma inguinal is a painless ulcer but it does not have lymphadenopathy. So, all of these are present which are mentioned in the question only in syphilis. So, the correct answer to question 1 here is option A that is syphilis. Whenever you get a question on genital ulcer, first of all, classify the ulcer into whether it is painless or it is painful. The painless ulcers will be syphilis and donovanosis. Painful ulcers include chancroid and genital herpes. Now, how to tell which is what? Next thing that you have to see is the lymph node. See what is mentioned about the inguinal lymph nodes. A painless ulcer with a bilateral painless inguinal lymphadenopathy is syphilis. So, a painless ulcer with painful uh, painless lymphadenopathy is syphilis and the one which does not have any lymph node enlargement, that is donovanosis. Coming to the painful ulcers, with chancroid, you will get a unilateral or a bilateral painful suppurative inguinal lymphadenopathy. So, here it is painful and it is suppurative inguinal lymphadenopathy. With genital herpes, it will be a bilateral painful lymphadenopathy. Okay, so first see whether the ulcer is painless or it is painful and then see what is mentioned about the inguinal lymph nodes. That's a very easy way to approach a question on genital ulcer. When the image is given along with the painless ulcer, either syphilis or donovanosis. Let us see how they will look. Primary syphilis will be a single well-defined ulcer. So, this will be a single round well-defined ulcer with a clean surface. So, this is a 
clean looking moist surface when you touch the ulcer it is painless and it is indurated painless and indurated are very very important hints towards a diagnosis of primary syphilis what is the smear that you make you make a wet smear here do a dark ground microscopy and what you see are these spiral bacteria with typical corkscrew motility this question was asked last year in the exam so what is the motility of these bacteria corkscrew you see them in dark ground microscopy this is the most specific investigation for primary syphilis now the other painless ulcer that you have is donovanosis donovanosis is caused by the bacteria klebsiella granulomatis which is why it is also called as granuloma inguinal which was the option in the exam so that is the same as donovanosis here also it will be a single well defined ulcer but it will have exuberant granulation tissue which gives it a beefy red velvety appearance and this ulcer bleeds on touch also this is the only genital ulcer which does not have any lymph node enlargement so this is the only genital ulcer which does not have lymphadenopathy but sometimes a subcutaneous lesion of donovanosis looks like an inguinal swelling which is called as pseudo bubo so where is pseudo bubo seen it is seen in donovanosis when you make a crushed smear and stain it with jimsa stain you see these intracellular bacteria with bipolar staining yes this is how the bacteria looks like there is a bipolar staining this is called as the closed safety pin appearance and these are called as dono van bodies so these are called as dono van bodies not just the image of the ulcer but also the image of what you see in the smear from that ulcer are very important so when you have this painless ulcer with an image i hope you are seeing these images side by side and you are able to distinguish the images from each other syphilis will be a well defined small ulcer with a clean base donovanosis will have this exuberant granulation tissue which gives it a beefy red appearance now you come to the painful ulcers in the painful genital ulcers it could be chancroid or herpes genitalis chancroid will first of all you will see that there are multiple ulcers so there will be multiple ulcers with ragged irregular margins undermined edges that all you cannot necessarily look in the image what you see in the image are these two points number 1 that the ulcers are multiple and number 2 you see this yellow necrotic slough on the surface of the lesion very important hints towards an image of chancroid are these yellow necrotic slough that you see on the surface and when you touch the ulcer when you examine the patient it is painful and it is non indurated so chancroid ulcers are classically non indurated when you make a gram smear you see these bacteria arranged parallel to the mucus threads this is called as the rail road track appearance or the school of fish appearance this image has been asked multiple times in the aims exam so please see these bacteria arranged parallelly this is called as the railroad track or the school of fish appearance now when you have these grouped vesicles on a red base and it is mentioned that these are painful so you have these painful grouped vesicles on an erythematous base that is herpes genitalis sometimes you may not be given an image of the vesicle you can be given an image of the erosion those erosions will also be grouped and they will be polycyclic so either grouped vesicles or grouped erosions with bilateral painful inguinal lymphadenopathy the answer is herpes genitalis and what is the smear that you make from it you make a zank smear and what you see are these beautiful cells here which are called as multi nucleate giant cells so the finding in a herpetic smear is 
multi nucleate giant cells along with mngs you also see these cells here which are these round cells with a large nucleus what are these these are acantholytic cell because herpes is a cause of secondary acantholysis so you see these acantholytic cells here also called as zanc cells this question was asked in 2021 inict very important findings in the zanc smear two findings you should know the multi nucleate giant cells and the acantholytic cells so this is how you identify various images of genital ulcer sometimes you can also get an image of bubo so what exactly is a bubo bubo are painful suppurative inguinal lymph nodes which are enlarged so you have enlarged painful suppurative inguinal lymph nodes that is called as a inguinal bubo now there are two causes of bubo it can be seen in lymphogranuloma venereum and it can be seen in chancroid so what is what now lgv will be just a bubo since it is a secondary stage here patient will come only with the painful bubo there will be no ulcer seen at that time on the other hand in chancroid you see the bubo and you see the ulcer so both ulcer and the bubo are present at the same time it is called as concomitant ulcer in bubo so in lgv the ulcer was the first stage it healed the patient came to you when the inguinal lymph nodes were enlarged at that time you don't have any ulcer in lgv on the other hand in chancroid the ulcer and the swelling are present at the same time also in lgv you see a sign which is called as the groove sign of greenblatt this is called as the groove sign of greenblatt okay so this is lg we now these were all the images in std that you can get coming to question number 2 the wife of a truck driver presents with vaginal discharge and on examination cervical erosions were seen which of the following shall be prescribed this is a slightly tricky question first of all the hint that you take here is that this is the wife of a truck driver which is a high risk group so truck drivers are high risk group for stds the wife here is presenting with genital discharge so the wife here is presenting with genital discharge in women the genital discharge can either be because of a vaginal infection or a cervical infection so either it could be a vaginitis or it could be a cervicitis now when it is cervicitis there will be discharge plus when you examine on a post speculum examination you will see a muco purulent discharge coming from the cervix okay you will see a muco purulent discharge coming from the cervix in vaginal discharge you will see only a vaginal discharge on the walls and in some cases you may see other findings now what does the question here say does the question here say that on examination there was a mucopurulent discharge no it does not mention that so that rules out cervicitis as a cause of discharge in this patient okay so cervicitis is out we now focus on causes of vaginal discharge what are the causes of vaginal discharge three important causes number 1 trichomoniasis number 2 candidiasis and number 3 bacterial vaginosis now what are the findings that you see in bacterial vaginosis you will just see a foul smelling homogeneous watery discharge so you will see a foul smelling homogeneous watery discharge in candidiasis there will be a curdy white discharge adherent to the vaginal 
walls and in trichomoniasis there will be a greenish frothy discharge along with that there will be cervical erosions which look like strawberry cervix so the cervix will be having small small erosions which will look like strawberry cervix so now coming back to the question here the patient is presenting with vaginal discharge with cervical erosions so what is the diagnosis the diagnosis here is trichomoniasis which is a type of vaginal infection now what is the kit that you give for it green gray yellow or red yes the answer to vaginal discharge is green kit that is option a so the answer for this question is green kit actually this question is not really wanting you to make a diagnosis as to what is the cause of trichomoniasis all that it wants is whether you can differentiate if it is a vaginal infection or it is a cervical infection so this is what the question is asking you whether you will give a green kit or you will give a gray kit now that is what you have to know here it is not cervicitis because there is no mucopurulin discharge noticed on the speculum so the answer here is a vaginal discharge and thus the kit that you use here is the green kit if you are able to know that this is trichomoniasis that is just an additional good point you know further they may ask you this also now talking about the syndromic management of stds the various syndromes that we treat include the genital discharge genital ulcer disease pid or the lower abdomen pain and inguinal bubo in genital discharge we include the causes of urethral or cervical discharge and we have vaginal discharge in genital ulcer disease there are patients who have non herpetic genital ulcer disease and patients who have herpetic genital ulcer disease so these are basically the group of patients that we are treating now let us look at the kits we have seven kits here okay you should know the number as well as the color of these kits so we have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 kits with their numbers now starting from the top the first kit which is the gray kit is used for urethral or cervical discharge and the second kit is for vaginal discharge so the first two kits cater to patients who have genital discharge first one with urethral or cervical infection and second is a vaginal discharge next three kits that we have they cater to genital ulcer disease where the white kit is for patients who have non herpetic genital ulcer disease who are penicillin tolerant means they can take penicillin and the blue kit is for the group of patients who have non herpetic genital ulcer but who are penicillin allergic so in patients who cannot take penicillin you give the blue kit and the red kit is for patients who have herpetic genital ulcer that is genital herpes now the yellow kit is for patients who are suffering from pid or lower abdominal pain and the black kit is for patients suffering from inguinal bubo so these are the seven kits with their seven syndromes very very important question these days very often asked not just the number of the kit but the color of the kit also you have to remember there is a mnemonic here which you can use to remember look at earth what is the color at the center of earth earth is gray in color so the earth is gray in color on the surface of the earth what do you have you have a green grass and what you make on a green grass is a white building so in the gray earth you have green grass on it there is a white building when you stand on that building what do you see you see sky sky is blue in color so what you see is blue sky the sky is red in the morning yellow in the afternoon and it is black 
in the night. So this is how you can remember these kits with their colors. Grey earth, green grass, white building, blue sky, which is red in the morning, yellow in the afternoon and black in the night. So this is about the syndromic management of STDs. So coming to the next question, diarrhea, dermatitis and dementia is caused by a deficiency of a very often repeated question. So I'm sure all of you know the answer. The three Ds, diarrhea, dermatitis and dementia, where are they seen? They are seen in pellagra, which is caused due to deficiency of niacin. So the correct answer here to this question is niacin. They are asking nutritional deficiency questions almost every exam since the last four years. There have been questions on pellagra, on phrenoderma, on acrodermatitis enteropathica. So very, very important is this, uh, you know, one small topic with hardly three, four diseases and they are asking it every year. Okay. Niacin causes pellagra, which has these three Ds. Riboflavin causes angular stomatitis and it also causes the corneal neovascularization in the eye. Okay, so that is what happens in riboflavin deficiency. Thymine deficiency causes beriberi, biotin, you don't really need to know. So coming to pellagra here, it is due to deficiency of niacin and apart from the three Ds, if it remains untreated, the patient will ultimately die. So diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia and death. This is what you see in pellagra. It is more common in two groups of patients. One who are maize eaters and two alcoholics. So if either of these is mentioned in the exam, that is a further hint towards diagnosis of pellagra. What you see in the image here is the typical photosensitive rash of pellagra here on the neck. It is called as Kessel's necklace. So this is also an important image. Photosensitive rash on the neck is Kessel's necklace, which you see in pellagra. Then the other two diseases they ask, phrenoderma and acrodermatitis enteropathica. Phrenoderma, also called as toad skin, happens due to deficiency of white, fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, E and K. Here you see these dry-looking papules. These dry looking papules on the extensors like the elbows, knee, buttock. So these dry looking papules on the elbow, knee and the buttock, these are called as phrenoderma. This image was given in the exam two years back. Then we have acrodermatitis enteropathica which is due to zinc deficiency. This is an inherited disease with autosomal recessive inheritance. You generally see it after about six months of age in the baby where there is an erosive rash on the face or the groin area. This is called as acrodermatitis enteropathica. These three images you should know by heart. Now, coming to the next question, a 35-year-old obese female with hirsutism presents with lesions as shown below. She is not responding to isotretinoin and antibiotics. What is the next step? So this patient is not responding to isotretinoin or antibiotics. But first, let us see what is the diagnosis. In the image, we see these multiple red papules and pustules on the face. There are also some comedons. So where do you see these lesions? You see this in acne. So the diagnosis here is acne. Along with that, we also see dark coarse terminal hair in the beard region of this girl. This is called as hirsutism when you have terminal hair in the androgen dependent areas in females. So this is hirsutism. Patient is suffering from acne. She is suffering from hirsutism and she is 35 years old. So that is a middle-aged patient. You don't have the normal acne at 35 years of age. So this patient has obesity, she has acne and she has hirsutism. Together, this tells you that there is an underlying hormonal basis to this patient's acne. So this patient is 
suffering from a hormonal issue which is causing the acne and thus this is called as hormonal acne. Why so? Because number one, she has acne and hirsutism. Two, she has obesity. So, there may be chances of insulin resistance in this patient. All of this gives you the hint that she may be suffering from hormonal acne. The additional hint in the question is that she is not even responding to the routine treatments for acne. Had it been routine treatment, she would have responded to antibiotics, she would have responded to isotretinoin. But since there is an underlying hormonal trigger, the routine treatments for acne will not work till you evaluate and treat that cause. So, what is the next step? Will you look for antibiotic resistance? No, because in a patient suffering from antibiotic resistance, they will respond well to isotretinoin, but she is not doing the same. Look for triggering drugs, no history given in the question. And when you have drug induced acne, it is mostly a monomorphic acne form eruption that you see. Okay, the lesions are just red papules. You don't see these pleomorphic lesions which are typical of acne vulgaris. In triggering drugs, number one, there is no history. Number two, the lesions in the drug induced acne form eruption are monomorphic. And look for dietary triggers. Again, there is no such history. Generally, it is a high glycemic uh, index uh, foods that can increase acne, more of a dairy can increase acne. But then that would also respond to antibiotics and isotretinoin because that will just increase acne. It will not like be the sole cause. Next is evaluate for hyperandrogenism. Definitely, yes. This is what we discussed even before looking at the options. In this patient, we will evaluate for hyperandrogenism. Look for an underlying hormonal cause, treat it, only then the patient will get the benefit that she wants. The drug of choice for hormonal acne is ciproteron acetate. So, the drug of choice for hormonal acne is ciproteron acetate. Mind you, we are not here talking about drug of choice for PCOD or other hyperandrogenic syndromes. No, I am just talking about hormonal acne there. There are multiple syndromes which have hormonal issues and acne like the Saha syndrome, the Safo syndrome, but that's a very separate group basically associated with insulin resistance. Here I am just telling you about the drug of choice for hormonal acne. Now, when we talk about treatment of normal acne, we divided into four grades, one, two, three, and four. For the first stage, which is comedonal acne, the drug of choice here is topical retinoids. So you treat these patients with topical retinoids like tretinoin and adapalene. Okay, tretinoin and adapalene. For patients with grade two, that is papular acne, along with the retinoids, we add topical antibiotics like clindamycin, dapsone, nadifloxacin. So, these are the topical antibiotics that we add. For patients with pustular acne, we have to add oral antibiotics. In the oral antibiotics, we give the tetracycline group of drugs like doxycycline, minocycline or macrolides like azithromycin and we can also give clindamycin orally. Minocycline as a drug has an important side effect of pigmentation. So, one drug that you use for acne that is minocycline can lead to a side effect of blue-black pigmentation in the acne scars. Lastly, if the patient has the most severe type of acne which is nodulocystic acne, you do give retinoids but orally. So, here the patient is going to take oral retinoids that is isotretinoin at a dose of 1 mg per kg per day. The most important side effect that you have to keep in mind is that it is a teratogenic drug. The patient has to have a negative UPT and use double contraceptives if it is a married woman starting isotretinoin for acne. Now coming to question number 5. A 35-year-old lady with history of hair dye application presents with the following clinical picture. What is the cause? So, the question here is giving us a hint that the patient has applied 
hair dye. So whatever she has may be related to hair dye. Now, what do we see in the image? In the image, we see that there is a lot of facial swelling. So there is a lot of facial swelling and erythema that you see in the image. Since you have a history of hair dye application, this is most likely due to the contact dermatitis which is caused by application of hair dye. Now, what is the chemical here? Drug intake, no history mentioned. Pollen is not a part of this because again there is no history and we have actually a history of hair dye. So, what is the chemical in hair dye? The chemical in hair dye is this option B that is paraphenyl diamine which we also know as PPD. So, PPD is the most important chemical in hair dye which causes the allergic contact dermatitis to hair dye. This is having a type 4 hypersensitivity response as the pathogenesis and you see the lesions on the scalp as well as the face as you see in the image. So, there may be swelling, oozing and redness on the face as well as the scalp. Here, just an extra point that I want to tell you, like somebody who is applying the hair dye will have lesions on the scalp and the face and there is also another person involved here. The other person that is involved here is the salon worker. What does he use? He uses his hands. So, this patient may develop hand eczema due to hair dye. So, this is actually a question that you may be asked in the INICT group. A salon worker with the recurrent hand eczema, what may be the most important cause? In such people, hand eczema due to paraphenylene diamine is a very important reason of their problem. So, just see on the face on the scalp for somebody who is actually applying the hair dye and hands of the patient who is doing it. This is all hair dye dermatitis. Then we have question number six here. What is the long term complication of this condition? So, the question is not giving us any hint. It is just giving us an image here and asking us what is the long term complication. So, let us see what this boy has. This boy has a lesion on the face which is black in color and it has dark coarse terminal hair as you can see. Black lesion with dark black hair on it. What is the diagnosis? When you have this typical clinical picture, the diagnosis is congenital melanocytic nevus. So the diagnosis here is congenital melanocytic nevus because number one, it's black in color and it is associated with dark black hair. So this is a congenital melanocytic nevus. Does it have a long term complication? Not really. This is generally a benign lesion. Okay, generally a benign lesion. But sometimes in some patients, there may be a long term complication of developing malignant melanoma. So, the correct answer to this question here is malignant melanoma. Yes, there may be some confusion in the form of glaucoma because in ophthalmology you have read that some of these patients may also develop that. But the most important long-term complication that you have to monitor in this patient is the developing of malignant melanoma. Why? Because in patients who have a giant nevus which is more than 20 centimeter square in diameter or if they have hypertrichosis, there is a risk of malignant melanoma developing. So, that is a very important complication for which you have to keep monitoring the patient. What do you see? You evaluate the A, B, C, D of the lesion in the patient. And in order to make a diagnosis, a further hint sometimes in the exam is that the lesion is present since birth. So, a congenital melanocytic nevus is present since birth. It is black in color and it has coarse black hair in it. Okay, so no doubt in the diagnosis and no doubt in the complication. So, the correct answer here is option A that is malignant melanoma as a long term complication of this lesion. Coming to question number 7. This is an HIV positive adult male who has presented with hyalur lymphadenopathy and lung involvement with lesions on the face as shown 
CV NAT is negative, what is the diagnosis? So this is actually an example of a true clinically integrated question. It not just has a dermatology image, but it also has the systemic involvement that is the medicine, medical involvement of the patient. So this is actually what they call as the clinically integrated questions. The patient here has a lung involvement in the form of hyalur lymph nodes and maybe some patches in the lung. And on the skin, what do you see in the image? You see these multiple papules and some of these show a central umbilication and one is also ulcerated. So what you see are these papules with a central umbilication. What is this? Now, in dermatology, whenever we say papules with a central umbilication, for us, that always means molluscum. So, can I mark option B here, which is molluscum contagiosum? Because that is mostly the lesion that I know that has central umbilication. So, why do I have option of histoplasmosis, cryptococcus, or disseminated TB here? Why? Because these are also umbilicated lesions that you see in dermatology. We know molluscum contagiosum, definitely yes, we know it, but, but there are also other causes of umbilicated lesions. We have cryptococcus, histoplasmosis, penicillosis, histoid leprosy, keratoacanthoma and BCC. Apart from this, there are many more, but these are the most important that you should know. So, these are also causes where you would get a papule with a central umbilication. Now, coming back to the question, the question is also giving us the hint of a lung involvement. Okay, it is telling us that the patient not just has papules with central umbilication, he also has lung involvement. Now, lung involvement, you would think tuberculosis. Ho sakta hai, patient could lung me tuberculosis ho or usko skin pe molluscum ho. But the question is telling you that the CBNAT is negative. So that rules out disseminated tuberculosis as a cause. Now coming to the other three questions, if it was just molluscum, you would have skin only involvement, no systemic involvement. So that is also not the correct answer here. Cryptococcus would yes, I have just told you cause this kind of a skin involvement. But these patients would also have cryptococcal meningitis. So this patient will have CNS features and there may also be a cryptococcal diarrhea here. So this patient will not just present with skin lesions, they will also present with CNS findings of photophobia, neck rigidity, etc. And there may be history of nausea, vomiting and diarrhea also. Histoplasmosis. Yes, in disseminated histoplasmosis, the patient will have skin involvement along with lung involvement. So this hyalur lymphadenopathy with lung involvement and these kind of umbilicated skin lesions, you would get that in this particular disease that is histoplasmosis. So the correct answer to question number seven here is option A that is histoplasmosis. Plasmosis. In molluscum, it would just be skin lesions, then there would be no relevance of the lung involvement. In cryptococcus, primarily CNS and intestinal involvement. So, the correct answer to question 7 here is histoplasmosis. Now, coming to this list, again with molluscum, you will see the typical pearly white dome shaped papules with central umbilication. Cryptococcus, I just told you, skin plus CNS plus diarrhea. Histoplasmosis, skin plus lung and penicillosis again would have some kind of systemic involvement. Histoid leprosy is a very important type where you get these papules with umbilication, but this patient will then also have sensory loss and in the smear you will have SSS positive. Keratoacanthoma will be a single lesion, then it will not just have an umbilication, there will be a central crater with yellowish keratin debris in it. Okay, so that look will be like this is a nodule and there will not just be a umbilication, it will also be filled with keratin debris here. And BCC will have a pearly surface with telangiectasias and it will show you the rolled up border hole 
so. So that is how you differentiate these various causes of umbilicated lesions in dermatology. Coming to the last question, a 50 year old male presented with history of HIV and painful lesions on the palate as shown below. What is the diagnosis? So a second question with HIV and skin involvement. What is this patient having? He is having in his mouth these reddish purple swellings you see here as well as on the gums. So what you see in the image are these reddish purple swelling on the hard palate and the gums. Where do you see this in a patient of HIV? We know HIV patient with the reddish purple lesions on the skin is Kaposi sarcoma. But this Kaposi sarcoma can also be present on the mucosa. So when you see this reddish purple lesions on the mucosa, you have to again think of Kaposi sarcoma. Okay, don't get confused that, okay, you've just seen images of the skin here. You've not seen the image of Kaposi sarcoma on the mucosa. But this is a mucocutaneous neoplasm. You can also have mucosal involvement. So the correct answer to this patient here is suffering from Kaposi sarcoma. The hints here is that number one, he is suffering from HIV. Number two, he has this reddish purple lesions. Together, this clinical scenario is Kaposi sarcoma. So the correct answer here is option C, that is Kaposi sarcoma. SCC would not look like this. Basal cell carcinoma would be on the skin, not on the mucosa. Again, it would be a very different clinical picture. Hepatocellular carcinoma is just an option here. It is not really how it presents. Just showing you this image of Kaposi sarcoma here, which you have seen across various teachings that these are the reddish purple lesions on the skin. But also remember that it can be present on the palate as well. And HHV8 will be present in all patients who have Kaposi sarcoma. When it is involving the oral cavity, that is mostly seen in patients who are suffering from AIDS, most commonly on the hard and soft palate. And on histopath, you will see the spindle cell proliferation of the vascular channels with a promontory sign positive. Immunohistochemistry is positive for LANA A1. So this is what is Kaposi sarcoma, not just on the skin, but can also be seen on the mucosa. So with this, we finish the video. I hope it clears all your doubts. And if you have any doubts, you can always mention them in the comments or in the Telegram channel. We will be happy to answer all of them. All the best. Study well, study hard for the upcoming exams.